Hi everyone, uh, this is Mr. Jeff coming to you from the Washington County Free Library. Uh, we're doing a series of Thursday evening stories, uh, Stories by Starlight, and we'll be coming to you uh, via Facebook for the next few weeks. Um, so I'm kicking off this, this program here uh, this evening, and um, I thought about what to read about, and I decided to talk about the month of November. One of the reasons is because I've got this book, which I want to read, called In November by Cynthia Ryland. But also, November is a pretty cool month. Um, a lot of things happening in November. Uh, fall is here, and the leaves are falling off the trees, and it's getting cooler outside. But uh, other things include we had just had an election. Every first Tuesday in November, we hold elections. And every four years, we have a presidential election. We just had that. And then next week uh, is Veterans Day. Uh, Veterans Day, we honor those um, men and women who served in our armed forces, which includes the Army and the Navy and the Marines and the Air Force and the National Guard, uh, Coast Guard, um, all the branches of the service that they've uh, given to our country, uh, their service. Um, Veterans Day commemorates the end of World War I, which happened in the end of it happened in 1918. Uh, on the 11th hour of the 11th month of the 11th day, uh, the armistice was signed in 1918 and it used to be that people would stop and take a moment to reflect on that at 11 o'clock on every November 11th so we might want to think about doing that this year. Of course also um, one of the big holidays of the year comes along which is Thanksgiving. Um, that's the time when we commemorate um, the landing of the pilgrims and, and and the feast they had with the Native Americans that were already living here when they, when they came. Um, the pilgrims were pretty, were pretty brave, I'll say that. I, I have a little model here of the ship. That the, um, This isn't their ship, but this is a ship like they would have sailed in. Uh, can you imagine going across the ocean in a leaky old wooden ship with sails? That didn't have, they didn't have engines back in those days. They just had to rely on the wind to blow the sa in the sails and, and sail them across the ocean. If the wind wasn't blowing, the ship wasn't going anywhere. And if the wind blew too hard, the ship could sink. So uh, I think you had to be pretty brave to get in a ship like that and cross the entire ocean in it. So, but that's what they did. And they settled here in uh, what's now America. Uh, of course, like I said, the Indians were here long before the pilgrims ever showed up. And the Indians actually helped them to um, raise things like, like corn and, and um, other vegetables that they didn't know anything about. So anyway, we do celebrate Thanksgiving. So there's a lot of reasons to uh, celebrate the month of November. Well, I want to start off by reading Cynthia Ryland's book in November, which talks about some of these things. It's got a mouse on the cover. And Cynthia Ryland's book is published by Harcourt Incorporated. Here's the title page, In November by Cynthia Ryland. Illustrated by Jill Kastner. There's a little mouse scurrying out from underneath the fall leaves there. In November, the earth is growing quiet. It is making its bed. It's a winter bed for flowers and small creatures. The bed is white and silent, and much life can hide beneath its blankets. So beneath a blanket of snow, life still exists. In November, the trees are standing all sticks and bones. Without their leaves, how lovely they are, spreading their arms like dancers. They know it's time to be still. If you ever walk down along the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal in the winter, you can hear the, the branches rubbing against each other. It's a very interesting, quieting sound. In November, some birds move away and some birds stay. The air is full of goodbyes and well wishes. The birds who are leaving look very serious. No silly spring chirping now. They have long journeys ahead and they must watch where they are going. So some birds fly far to the south to spend the winter, but other birds stay behind. The staying birds are serious too. For cold times lie ahead, hard times, all berries will be treasures. You know what kind of bird that is? Now those are cardinals. When you go outside, if you hear a little chirp, a little quick pip, sometimes that's the 
the cardinal talking. In November, the animals sleep more. The air is chilly, and they shiver. The farmer's got his, his coat on, and the cows are curled up together, and even the horse looks like he has a little heavier coat on, a little shaggier than, than usual. The cats pile up in the corner of barns. That's how they keep warm. They, they're in the hay, and they're all piled up together, maybe dreaming of mice. And speaking of mice, the mice pile up under logs, and the bees pile up in deep, earthy holes. So there the, there the bees are. They're in the deep, earthy holes there the mice. And the dogs lie before the fire. They come inside. We let them in and sit before the stove and they keep warm that way. In November the smell of food is different. It's an orange smell. It's a squash and pumpkin smell. It tastes like cinnamon and can fill up your house in the morning and can pull everyone from bed in a fog. Food is better in November than any other time of the year. Look, the kids are coming down the stairs. They smell that pie coming out of the oven. Of course, I think food smells good any time of the year, but I guess November, you do have the pumpkin pies and the turkeys and squashes and things like that. In November, people are good to each other. They carry pies to each other's homes, and they talk by crackling wood stoves, and they sip mellow cider. Of course the days are getting shorter and the sun goes down sooner in November so it's a good time to come inside and sit and read a book like this and in this case um, looks like they're getting ready for a gathering. They travel very far on a very special November day just to share a meal with one another and to give thanks for their many blessings for the food on their tables and for the babies in their arms. Of course, that very special day is what? That's right, Thanksgiving. Yep. They're all sitting around the table. Looks like they've got rolls and sweet potatoes and all kinds of things, cranberry sauce on their plates. And then they travel back home again. Look, they put their coats and their hats on. Everybody says goodbye. Of course, it's dark out by that time. The moon has come up. In November, at Winter's Gate, the stars are brittle, and the sun is a sometime friend. And the world has tucked her children in with a kiss on their heads until spring. So look at those stars. Brittle means that they're very hard and shiny looking. They're very brittle, like they could break. The moon is shining white and is reflecting off the snow in this picture. So it's a very cold looking picture at the end of November because we're at Winter's Gate. We're getting ready to go into the winter season. So that's the end of that story in November by Cynthia Ryland. So those are people and a few animals getting ready for the winter. I have one more book I want to read to you about another animal who has to get ready for the winter and that's the black bear. This is a story by Jim Arnosky called Every Autumn Comes the Bear. Now bears, they don't roam around in the, the woods in the wintertime. What do they do? Do you know? That's right. They go to sleep. They go to sleep for the winter. They eat all summer long and store up fat for the winter, and then they, they hibernate. That's the word for sleeping all winter. They hibernate. And let's see what happens. This is called Every Autumn Comes the Bear. It's by Jim Arnosky published by G.P. Putnam Sons from New York. And let's take a look at this book. Oh, look. There is a wooded hill behind our farm. So look, there's the, the roof of the house or the barn with the pigeons sitting on it and the weather vane. And you can see that behind the farm there's this hill. It looks like a mountain to me. A very rugged looking place. It is a wild and rugged place with as many rocks as trees. Can you see that porcupine? 
He's got his quills there. Porcupine lives on that mountain, on that hill. A very rocky place to live. Every autumn, after the leaves have fallen off the trees, a bear shows up. Oh, look, it's a black bear. That's the state animal of West Virginia, the black bear. Let's see what the bear is going to do. He comes to the mountain or the hill. He walks out on the cliff where the ravens perch. Oh, look, they're flying away. They're deciding that maybe that bear is a little bit too big for them to be around. He's standing on his hind legs, looking out over everything. Oh, look, he's baring his teeth. He growls into the bobcat's lair. Oh, look, the bobcat's growling back, but that bear is much bigger than, than that bobcat, so I think he's going to stay in his lair. The bear says, I'm the boss here. The bear follows every trail just to see where it leads. Now, bears can't see too well, but they have very keen hearing and they can have a very keen sense of smell. So he follows every trail just to see where it leads. He drinks cold water from the spring. Look, he's standing on a log. And look inside the log, you can see the little raccoon. He's curled up. He's going to sleep a little bit, too. He's not going to move much, though, because he doesn't want that bear to know he's there. But that bear can probably smell him anyway. He probably says, I know who's in there. But the bear just wants to drink. And he claws a tall, straight tree. If you ever go hiking in the woods, in the deep woods, sometimes you'll come across a tree that has bear claw marks on it. You can tell that a bear's been there, because he'll stand up and he'll sharpen his claws on the tree, much like a cat does. The other animals hide from the bear, but he knows they're there. He's not paying any attention to them, but he knows that deer is there, and he knows that those rabbits are crouched over there in the corner. He says, I know where you are. He smells the scent of the fox as the fox goes trotting along through the forest. And he hears a grouse bursting into flight. He startled that grouse. He must have been sitting on that low branch, and when he came padding along, the grouse got afraid and, and suddenly burst into flight and flew away. When the hill is white with snow, the bear climbs to the highest rock, and he looks out over all the treetops. This is his domain. He's the most powerful animal on the mountain. He looks out to see where everybody is. And then, searching amid the hilltop boulders, he finds a den and he crawls inside. This looks like a good place to spend the winter. I'm going to crawl into a cave and curl up. There he is, all curled up, nestled there against the cold rock with only his fat and his fur to keep him warm. Look, he's got his paws, his arms are covering his nose to stay warm. He sleeps all winter long. What do we call that word that you slept all winter long? That's right, it's called hibernation. He hibernates all winter long, what he does. Well, that's the end of that story of Every Autumn Comes the Bear by Jim Arnosky. So we read two books in November by Cynthia Ryland and Every Autumn Comes the Bear. I want to share one more story with you. On the flannel board, let me pull it over here. I've got my characters all set up to show and my flowers. This is an old story. It's called The Gunny Wolf. Nobody really knows where this story came from. But it's kind of an interesting story. It has a little girl in it and her mother and some flowers. And of course, we'll meet the gunny wolf. Once upon a time, there was a little girl who lived with her mother next to a deep forest. And every day, mother would tell little girl, now you can play in the front yard or you can play in the backyard, but don't you go into that forest because there's a mean old gunny wolf in there and he might eat you up. 
and every day the little girl would promise her mother that she would never, ever go anywhere near the forest. Well, guess what she did? That's right. <laughs> She's going to go into that forest, isn't she? One day, the mother has a jug on her shoulder. One day, mother said, Now, little girl, I have to go to town, and while I'm gone, you stay here and mind the house. And you can play in the front yard, and you can play in the backyard, but whatever you do, don't you go into that forest, because there's a gunny wolf in there, and he might eat you up. Little girl promised her mother that she would not go anywhere near that forest. Mother said, very well, goodbye. So she waved goodbye to the little girl. She walked down the road, and she turned the corner, and she was gone. So the little girl was all by herself in her yard, and for a while she amused herself by playing. But she happened to look up, and there at the very edge of that deep, dark forest, were the most beautiful white flowers she'd ever seen. Oh, she said, if I could only pick those white flowers, we would have the most beautiful supper table in all the forest. So even though her mother told her not to go there, little girl went to the very edge of the forest, and she began to pick the white flowers, and she sang her song. She sang, Kumqua Kiwa, Kumqua Kiwa, Kumqua Kiwa. Can you sing that song? Let's pick the flowers. Kumqua Kiwa, Kumqua Kiwa, Kumqua Kiwa, and she picked the white flowers. Well, little girl was going to come back out of the forest after she picked those flowers, but she happened to look over her shoulder and look. Oop, halfway into the forest, she saw the most beautiful pink flower she'd ever seen, and she said, oh, if I could just pick those pink ones, I could put them with my white ones, and wouldn't we have the most wonderful bouquet of flowers on our supper table? So even though her mother told her not to, Little girl went halfway into the forest after she had picked the white flowers. And she picked the pink flowers too. And what did she sing? The same song. Kumqua kiwa, kumqua kiwa, kumqua kiwa. And she picked the beautiful pink flowers too. Now she was going to come right back out of that forest. But it just happened that she looked over her shoulder. And in the very center of the forest, she saw the most beautiful flowers of all. And they were colored orange. Oh, she said, if I could pick those orange flowers, I'd have white ones and pink ones and orange ones, and wouldn't we have the most beautiful bouquet to put on our supper table? So even though her mother told her not to, little girl went to the very center of the forest, skipping along until she got to those orange flowers after she had picked these pink ones. And when she got to the orange flowers, she began to pick them and sing her song. She sang, Kumqua Kiwa, Kumqua Kiwa, Kumqua Kiwa. Guess what happened? As she picked the last of these orange flowers and was turning to go home, up rose the gunny wolf. Uh-oh. He was sleeping behind those orange flowers. He was huge. He had big feet. He had sharp ears. He had great big sharp teeth. He was colored blue, and he could talk. And do you know what he said? He said, little girl, why for you move? And the little girl was afraid. She said, I no move. And the gunny wolf said, hmm, then you sing that guten sweeten song again. So the little girl sang her song. She sang, kumqua kiwa, kumqua kiwa, kumqua kiwa. Well, the old gunny wolf, he liked that song. He nodded his head and nodded. He went off to sleep. As soon as he went to sleep, what do you think the little girl did? That's right. She ran away. She ran like this. Can you make your hands go pit-a-pat, pit-a-pat, pit-a-pat? So she ran. Pit-a-pat, 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 pit-a-pat. But the old gunny wolf, he woke up and he ran like this. He ran. Hunkercha, hunkercha, hunkercha. Can you do that? Can you go? Hunkercha, hunkercha, hunkercha. So the little girl ran. Pit-a-pat, pit-a-pat, pit-a-pat. Gunny wolf went. Hunkercha, hunkercha, hunkercha. He caught up with a little girl. He said, no, little girl. Why for you move? I know move, said the little girl. Hmm, then you sing that guten sweeten song again. So the little girl sang her song. Kumqua kiwa, kumqua kiwa, kumqua kiwa. And the old gunny wolf, he nodded and went off to sleep again. He went. <coughs> as soon as he was asleep, away ran the little girl. Pit a pat, pit a pat, pit a pat through the forest. But the old gunny wolf, he woke up again. And how did he run? He ran. Hunkercha, hunkercha, hunkercha until he caught up with the little girl again. He said, no, little girl, why for you move? Little girl said, 
I no move. Gunny Wolf said, Well, then you sing that good and sweetened song again. So she sang, Come qua kiwa, come qua kiwa, come qua kiwa. And the old Gunny Wolf, he fell fast asleep. He went, <laughs> Away ran the little girl, pit a pat, pit a pat, pit a pat, through the forest. She ran, pit a pat, pit a pat, pit a pat, out of the forest. She ran, pit a pat, pit a pat, pit a pat, into her house. The only problem was, as she was running through the forest, why she was dropping all those flowers that she had picked that morning. As a matter of fact, the only flowers she had left were one of these orange ones right here. So she had an orange flower left, and she put that on the supper table. And by and by, Mother came back from town. And Mother looked over and she saw the beautiful orange flowers. And she said, little girl, where did you get that orange flower? Do you think the little girl told her mother where the orange flower came from? I think she probably did. She probably said, Mother, I couldn't resist it. I just went into that forest and I picked that orange flower. And Mother might have said, Did you see the gunny wolf? Oh, yes, said the little girl. I saw him. He didn't eat you up? Oh, no, said the little girl. He liked my song. Mother must have shaken her head and said, Little girl, Never, ever go back into that forest again because next time he might not like your song. And to my knowledge, the little girl never went back into the forest again and she never met the old gunny wolf. But he did like her song. <laughs> That's the end of that story. Well, thank you for coming to uh, Stories by Starlight. I've enjoyed reading um, Cynthia Ryland's book in November and Jim Arnosky's book Every Autumn Comes the Bear and doing the flannel board with you. I hope that you come back next week uh, and someone will be here. I think Miss Susan will be reading some stories and talking about some other things and in the meantime I hope that you visit the library and we have all kinds of books that you can check out and you can take home and you can read uh, or have your parents read to you bedtime stories. It's always important to keep that reading habit up and we will see you next week. So thanks again for coming, and bye-bye.